Welcome to APM's 50th Anniversary Speaker Series. For this program, the third in a series of four events, we'll focus on the complex and crucial subject of great importance to our city, community and economic development. We'll also welcome for a lively and informative conversation, journalist and ABC News correspondent, John Quinones. Mr. Quinones will join our panel of experts to discuss the topic through the lens of inequality, race and gentrification. The panel will include Brian Hudson, former CEO, Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, Councilwoman Maria Quinones Sanchez, and Fred Banuelos, Community Investment Business Development Manager, Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh. This program is made possible by the generous support of our diamond sponsors and community partners, PICO, and Villanova Insurance Partners. Our program book is supported by the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency. Additional support for this panel was provided by the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh and Fox Rothschild. For five decades, APM has been working with Philadelphian families to live their best lives and be self-reliant while building futures for our city. Today, they serve 40,000 people each year, transforming the city. Our neighbors are eager for progress. We've seen it. For over 50 years, we've watched our neighbors working hard to get where they want to be, taking steps to move forward in their lives. Our neighborhood is artistic, welcoming, diverse, hardworking, relaxing, athletic, and lively. However, Philadelphia has had its fair share of issues to overcome. Since 1970, APM has been here to help people with these issues. APM's philosophy is simple. If we help our neighbors, we help their families. If we help their families, we help our community. Asociación Puertorriqueños en Marcha, for everyone, was created when a group of Puerto Rican Vietnam veterans returned home and found that their community was in need. Our neighborhood is better because a few people took a look around at these socioeconomic issues and said, we're not gonna let this happen to our neighbors. Our neighbors are brave, determined people, and APM is here to help. What started as a staff of five, housed in a Germantown Avenue storefront, has changed to a massive network of social services in over 10 sites throughout North Philadelphia. At APM, we don't just work in the community, we are the community. Many of our neighbors work at APM. Today, we employ over 400 multilingual, multicultural professionals, and we serve more than 40,000 people each year. For years, APM has implemented programs to address the issue of food insecurity in our area. We've worked hard to provide our neighbors with access to healthy foods, even building a cousin's grocery store in the middle of what was then a food desert. We provide assistance in home buying for those who need a permanent place to stay. Many of those homes we've even built ourselves. For the kids of our community, we have an early education program where they can learn essential skills. Though predominantly Puerto Ricanos, we're here for everyone. So we provide a wide range of services to benefit the whole community. Our mental health facilities and drug rehabilitation centers provide a community of support for our neighbors fighting addiction. We cover everything from foster care and children's services to community development, building assets for families and their community. Besides our core programs, we stretch our funding to sponsor community events like neighborhood cleanup days and short-term service projects. APM is still around today because the people of the community look at all the issues and say, we're not gonna let that happen to our neighbors. We will be here as long as families need us. Because if we can help families, we can help our community. And if we can help our community, then we can help our city.
Honored guests, friends, and neighbors, welcome to the APM 50th Anniversary Speaker Series. And now, to offer opening remarks, welcome APM President and CEO, Nilda Ruiz. Thank you and bienvenidos, un gran abrazo virtually, of course, as we welcome you all to the APM Speaker Series, commemorating the Asociación Puerto Riqueños en Marcha, five decades of service and commitment to the betterment of the Hispanic and other underserved communities in our beloved city of Philadelphia. This year, APM marks its 50th anniversary with this speaker series that spotlights four essential and crucial areas that our staff work on every day. This speaker series has highlighted with informative and enlightening discussions the importance of behavioral health, early childhood education, and how they affect our Puerto Rican Latino neighborhoods and all our residents. In December, for our final event, we'll look at the Child Protective Services and welcome guest speaker, child safety advocate, advocate Elizabeth Smart. Today, our focus is critical, is a critical subject of community and economic development, focusing on affordable housing, inequality, race, and gentrification. And in a few words, we'll, and in a few minutes, I'm sorry, we'll have a conversation with ABC News correspondent, John Quinones. For years, his program, What Would You Do?, has provided a surprising look into our country and its people. I'm looking forward to what will, sure, what will surely be a thought-provoking conversation led by our good friend and colleague, Brian Hudson. Needless to say, this has been a critical time for our community our city and our world. Allow me to take a moment to offer my sincere and heartfelt gratitude to all of our city's essential workers and every worker who continues to safely do their job in order for all of us to live with some sense of normalcy. And most recently, thank you to all the volunteer, and citizen, volunteer citizen poll workers who spent hours counting and making sure that every vote got counted under intense pressure from the country awaiting results. I want to salute um, your commitment and dedication. Please stay safe. A special thanks to our board of directors for their leadership and our 50th anniversary host committee for their support and guidance in producing this anniversary event. I'd also like to take an opportunity to offer my own virtual standing ovation and applauding everyone who works at APM. Our vision is a healthy community where all families are self-reliant, where children are protected and nurtured to become future leaders, and where residents are engaged in their community and in everyday life. Together, we work towards these goals. I'm proud of the work that we do on a daily basis, what we've accomplished together. And we're grateful to our good friends and valued partners in supporting us today to bring this program to our friends, neighbors, colleagues, and you, the audience. Many thanks to Villanova Insurance Partners. Gracias to our program book sponsor, the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, and a special thank you to their executive director and CEO, Robin Wiseman, for her leadership and continued support in the housing effort. And muchísimas gracias to our friends at PICO, Michael Inocencio, Ramona Roque Benson, Kia Branson Davis, and to PICO trustee Judge Nelson Diaz. Let's take a look at this message. At PICO, we understand that a lot has changed. Like where you get a haircut and who does it where new lessons are learned and new careers are found and even new ways to run your business. But no matter how much things change, you can depend on PICO to be there with the energy and help you need to power through. Thank you. Um, many thanks again to PICO and all our community partners. Today's subject is at the heart of everything that we do. Community and economic development is not only timely and crucial, it's a complex matrix of ideas on why it's important, 
who does it help, and how to make it happen. I often refer to it as the sexy part of APM because you're able to drive by, see its work, you can touch it and feel it, but it is so much more than bricks and mortar. We hope to bring some clarity to the subject with our panel discussions, connecting these two issues of community and economic development and making them work successfully is no easy task. It's about the bottom line, meeting poverty issues. It's a challenge that requires leadership and commitment. Every day we at APM work to strengthen that foundation by working with families to purchase affordable housing. We know that a home is more than just a place where you live. A home that you may call your own is a place of shelter, a place of comfort, dreams and growth. And a home can be the catalyst that brings people from poverty to the consciousness of wealth. I'm glad to have Brian Hudson, the former CEO of PHFA with us today as our moderator. It was a pleasure to work with Brian knowing he could embrace both the bottom line and the poverty line. He understood that inequality, race, and gentrification are major issues in this area. I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists, our friend and supporter, Councilwoman Maria Quinones, from Federal Home Loan Bank, Fred Banuelos. We've all been in the trenches together, striving, planning, moving uh, the home ownership needle in the right direction. And I'm so happy you all will have an opportunity to hear from these terrific folks. And from our special guest, Mr. John Quinones, who will join in the conversation. Maybe we'll give him a few ideas for his next show. Home ownership provides a foundation for a family that leads to financial security. That is what APM is all about. The goal is for families to be self-sufficient, to move forward, to not be dependent on anyone or any program. This is what makes the difference in the family's future. And APM has, a great, has great success. I like to say that once our clients came full circle in the area of family growth, a young woman who came to us as a victim of domestic violence, we offered the supportive services that helped her get out of a very miserable situation. She and her children lived in our shelter. Soon she was volunteering at APM. She received training to secure herself a job. And with that, was able to move into an APM rental unit with her children. Then she saw that we were building houses for home ownership, affordable housing, and she was one of our first ones to purchase those homes. She, that, um, that she became a homeowner, once her, daughter, once her daughter saw that she became a, and grew up, now her daughter purchased her own home and they're attending college. And I believe one of them just finished her master's degree. During Hurricane Maria, Many people relocated from Puerto Rico to our city. APM was able to get them acclimated to their new life. We served about 2,300 families from Puerto Rico, holding everything they needed. There were 250 families that, were, that we worked with directly, relocating them, getting them vouchers, getting them into public housing, and just providing them a sense of community. At APM, we hired about 10 of these evacuees, and one of these young men were ab was able to work for us. He rents one of our apartments, has learned English very well, and now he's our property manager. And just last week, he bought his first home. These are just two examples of so many of what APM accomplishes working together with our organizations, the city, with private partners. I'm so very proud of what we do, and even more, I'm so proud of the families we see thriving. And now to continue our program, I have the honor of introducing a Philly native, someone who worked at APM before and is returning home, as I did, as our Chief Operating Officer, Manuel Delgado. He has worked in our community. He has worked in the community development field with passion and commitment. His experience includes working with private and public stakeholders, always with the goal of empowering communities. In his new hometown of Morristown, New Jersey, 
He was a member of the City Planning Commission, Low Income Housing Committee, and in 2016 was the first elected to serve as mayor, the first Puerto Rican and first Hispanic to hold that position in that city. As you can see, I'm very proud of him and looking forward for you to get to know him too. So without any further delay, let's welcome him, APM COO, Manuel Delgado. Thank you, Nelda. It's great to be back in Philadelphia working with you and with the team at APM. As a native of Philadelphia returning after 13 years, it's clear that the last city population is growing annually, many median income has increased, unemployment pre-COVID was the lowest in a decade, and the percentage of residents with college degrees has grown. As I drive through the city, through the area where my family lives, and through the area APM serves, the economic growth and the change in the physical landscape is amazing. But we know that cities thrive when all people live in safe, stable, affordable homes, neighborhoods connected to opportunities without fear of displacement. And as we dig deeper, Philadelphia has not reached every family. Black and Latino families make up 73% of Philadelphia's poverty population. 50% of Hispanic households and 46% of Black households pay more than 30% of their income on rent. Black and Latino families are more likely to live in an area of racially concentrated poverty. In short, there are stark class, racial, and economic differences across our neighborhood. Nationally, we can see that we've moved from the suburbanization of the white middle class to the new allure of downtown living. Cities all across the nation are making policy decisions, zoning changes, and resource allocations that spur private investment and increase neighborhood desirability. And when successful, we then see a movement of people drawn to neighborhoods by the proximity of employers. As areas experience this rapid reinvestment, the displacement of Black and Latino residents has become a national concern. In a recent study conducted by NCRC Research, which looked at gentrification at the census tract level from 1990 to 2010, the data shows Black and Hispanic population decreases and white increases was prevalent in cities with a growing population, increase in median income level, increasing higher education levels, and increased public and private investment. Cities like Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and Charlotte had 33 gentrifying tracts with an overall displacement of 32% of Black families. L.A. and Houston had 16 tracts with a displacement of 22% of its Latino families. So where does Philadelphia fall? Well, Philadelphia ranks fourth nationally among cities with gentrified neighborhoods. And the population of Black and Hispanic families in gentrifying census tracts here decreased by 23%. Unfortunately, I believe that displacement numbers will increase over the next decade. So as I come back to work with the team at APM, I wonder about our targeted area. 50% of the population lives in poverty. 68% of the households rent their homes and 52% of them are cost burdens. Average sales have increased nearly 375,000, up 200% over the last 10 years. There's development pressure from Temple to the West, East Kensington and South East. Northern Liberty South. The community has incredible transportation infrastructure with the walking distance, an opportunity zone in development. So, how do we place equity at the center of the future development of this community? How do we expand and preserve affordability for our current our policies and investments to foster a healthy, economically integrated community? I'm looking forward to hearing our panel as they as they discuss inequality, race, and gentrification. But first, I'm pleased to introduce our panel moderator who will spend a few minutes in conversation with today's special guest, journalist and author, John Quinones. And I'm going to first tell you a bit about Mr. Quinones. Of course, we all know John for his work as a correspondent on ABC News. For more than 30 years, he covered and presented the news for the, for the network's most successful programs, including 2020 and Primetime, Good Morning America, ABC World News Tonight, and Nightline. More recently, as host and creator of a highly rated hidden camera ethical dilemma news magazine, What Would You Do? Mr. Quinones has literally become the face of doing the right thing to millions of fans. His inspiring personal journey began in Texas, where as a youngster, he labored alongside his family as a migrant farm worker. He 
first learned English when he attended elementary school at the age of six. Through grit and determination, John rose to become one of network television's most respected news reporters. Honored for his stellar work with the George Peabody Award and seven Emmy Awards. As an author, Mr. Quinones has penned two books, one of which we'll be discussing today based on a television show. What would you do? Words of wisdom about doing the right thing. Words of wisdom and guidance I'm sure we could all appreciate during these tumultuous times. Our panel moderator and joining Mr. Quinones in conversation is APM friend and colleague, Brian Hudson. Brian is a former executive director and CEO of the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, Pennsylvania's leading provider of capital for affordable homes and a public park. In my opinion, Brian has been doing the right thing throughout his 45-year career with the agency and the last 17 at the helm of the PHSA. A few of the many accomplishments under his leadership include the allocation of hundreds of millions of dollars of tax credit investment and in affordable rental housing across the Commonwealth, the growth of the State Housing Trust Fund to provide resources for addressing local housing needs, the expansion of the statewide housing counseling network. Join me in welcoming our panel moderator, Brian Hudson, for a conversation with special guest, John Quinones. <clears throat> thank you, Manuel, and welcome back, by the way. Uh, this is a pleasure. Uh, John, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, uh, when to start is everyone. So, John, I know you got a busy schedule. And I'm excited. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. I got a chance to meet you a while back when I was asked by APM to do this. I said, absolutely. It's always a pleasure <laughs> to hear your words of wisdom, quite truthfully. Um, and I want to say congratulations to APM on their 50th anniversary. It's a great organization. I'm proud to be associated with them. Keep doing the great work that you're doing. So, John, we're going to get right into it. So, uh, I all know right. we can talk all afternoon as far as I'm concerned, but I, I want to start. Obviously, if you're a popular uh, TV show, what would you do? It's one of my favorites also. Uh, yeah. What was the inspiration behind the show? Uh, what drove you to do that, if you could share? Uh, that thank you, Brian. Uh, first of all, yes, I want to congratulate and thank APVM for everything you guys are doing. You're doing God's work. Uh, and I'm so honored and so proud to be with you this morning. I wish I could be there with you this afternoon in person. Uh, saludarlos y abrazarlos, uh, you know, maybe next time, right? Um, but what would you do? Well, we came up with it about 14 years ago. I mean, I've been a reporter at ABC for 2020 and for all the other shows. And we wanted to do something that was different, something that took the hidden camera beyond where we normally use hidden cameras. Because, you know, hidden cameras have been used in reporting for television for decades. Uh, but we wanted to do something different, and uh, we came up with this idea to do one about what would you do? We read a story about a guy wrote an article about how he was at the park. He was a new father, and the nannies that are supposed to be taking care of children were ignoring the kids because these babysitters were texting or watching on YouTube with their headsets on, and meanwhile, the kid is, you know, in danger. Uh, how do you tell the parents that, uh, that the nanny is doing a terrible job? And we said, we think we can do better than that. We can actually put hidden cameras in the park, in the trash cans, in the trees. We'll have an actor play the part of the child uh, who's being babysat. And then we'll have a nanny who's an actress who's going to ignore the baby. And that was the very first one we did. And it did very well in the ratings. It was part of 2020. And ABC then said, John, that was great. Can you do another one of those? And I said, we can. We can come up with another idea. And then they said, can you do an entire hour? And we said, I think we can do an hour. And then they said, can you do three hours? And then six hours. And now we're doing 12 hours uh, every year for the last uh, 13, 14 years. And we're going to come back. Uh, we can't shoot it right now because of COVID, but, uh, but we will. The ABC wants another season. But that's how it started oh, with great. Annie. Oh, unbelievable. Well, I tell you, I, mm. given everything that's going on in the country today, it's a great yeah. To, to touch the conscience, if you will. And I know you had a lot of episodes, but what, which one was your favorite and, and, and why? And we're gonna show a video later, but if you can answer that question, we'll, uh, I'm curious as to what one really uh, touched you, I guess. You know, it's always the one that have to do with race and discrimination and, 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 and bullying and uh, discrimination against uh, religion. 
But race is at the top of the list because of who I am. You know, I'm Mexican American. I grew up in San Antonio in the barrio. Grew up in poverty. We were migrant farm workers. Uh, I used to shine shoes on Guadalupe Street on the west side of San Antonio. We go to all the cantinas, the bars, because the drunk guy, the borrachos, they didn't know how much they were tipping you, <laughs> right. and we made a killing. Uh, <laughs> uh, until we were jumped by a gang and they stole all my supplies and my earnings. But I know what it's like to be in Ohio after picking tomatoes all week and on a Sunday going to the Goodwill store to buy clothes for ourselves or to get a burger somewhere and being followed around by people who think you're going to steal something simply because you have dark skin and because you're speaking Spanish. So a lot of the scenarios that I love the most are those that we and by the way, this happens to this very day. It's gotten worse in the last four years. Yes, uh, we yeah. found that uh, people are much more willing to resort to their darkest impulses on hidden camera. In the old days, before, you know, five, six years ago, they wouldn't be as quick to condemn uh, people because of their race. Today, it's as if they've been given permission to do so. And many more people will speak out against uh, immigrants, will agree with the racist actor. It just blows me away how things have changed in the last few years. But those are my favorite ones. I think the very favorite one, and we'll show one of the clips, it's one of my favorites uh, in a little while. But I think the one we did on an interracial couple in Harlem, where in a black community, we had uh, a black guy with a white girl, and then the, they're both actors. And then we had a racist, the antagonist, a hairstylist, a black woman saying to the black guy, why are you with her? Why are you with a white girl? You know, aren't there enough strong black women in the world? Which happens in the black community. Um, and, and we thought we had done this scenario in a white community where there were some people who came out and agreed with the races. And I got all these angry letters saying, John, why do you make white people look out to be look like they're racist? If you do this scenario in Harlem, there will be just as many black racists there. So we said, OK, let's go to Harlem. And we went to a barber shop in an all black setting. And this black hairstylist is condemning the black guy for being with a white girl. And I got to tell you guys, every single person that day over and over again came to the defense of the white woman. And their message was very simple. After all the discrimination that we've been through as a race, how can you turn around and do it to that poor white girl? It was mind blowing. One woman who stepped in was happens to be gay and she was getting her hair done. And she said, I'm gay. Do you have anything against them? She said to the uh, racist black actress. And the woman said, no, it's just that I'm sending the wrong message to children to see a black guy with a white girl. And she said, what if she was bleeding on the ground? Would you stop to help her? And she said, listen to me. It's all about hugs. H-U-G-S. Hugs, right? And we were watching it intently, and she said, that stands for helping us grow spiritually. And man, we were just all in tears behind the scenes. So that has to be my favorite one. Oh, good, good, good. When well, You can say all these divisive things you want to say. You can vote the way you want to vote. But when you're faced, when you come face to face with discrimination like that, it resonates with you. And I think that's why people reacted the way they do. People who have nothing in common. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, very emotional. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I, I know you had episodes, either they were very, very funny or just totally unusual. Uh, one of those you could touch on for us, John. Well, yeah, well, some of the funnier ones, and we I like to do the serious uh, involving serious issues like race and religion, but uh, sometimes we'll do something, you know, kind of whimsical. We did one, and what would you do if you somebody stealing a bicycle? And you see them stealing a bike. So we, we, we chained a brand new bicycle to a pole in the park in New Jersey where people are jogging by and, you know, walking their dogs and pushing their baby stores. And we had an actor pretending they were stealing the bicycle. And first we did it with a white actor, you know, with a baseball cap, about 28 years old, with a hacksaw and wire cutters. And he's cutting the chain. And we told the actor, if people ask you if you're stealing it, say yes. Because we wanted people to know, not to think that he just lost his key. So he's cutting the chain, and people said, are you stealing that bicycle? He said, yeah, I need a bike. This one's been in here a while. I'm going to take this bike. When it was a white young man who was the thief, 
People shook their heads, they muttered something under their breath, but no one called 911. And then we switch actors, as we often do with the show. And this time, instead of a white young man, it was a black young actor with a hacksaw and wire cutters who starts cutting the chain. I got to tell you, Brian, within seconds after he started cutting that chain, he was surrounded by a posse of people who not only call 911, which they should have done with a white thief, but they're taking his video and picture with her cell phone saying, we got you now. Even the actor was like, John, this is ridiculous. The white guy got away with it. And then as a final twist, we had a very attractive young woman play the part of the thief. You know, her beautiful hair blowing in the wind. She had a short shorts and a hacksaw and the wire cutters. Very pretty girl. Men helped her steal the bike. Time and again, she oh. was cutting the chain. People are coming up. There was a couple, a middle-aged couple on their bicycles. And the wife to the man said, honey, she's stealing that bike. She said, yeah, but she's a damsel in distress. <laughs> you take the pole of the pole, and it tells you, man, it's human nature. Uh, it was uh, ridiculous. Pretty uh, ridiculous. Unbelievable. Um, that, those are great stories, John, by the way. Yeah. And you mentioned <clears throat> you are fifth uh, generation San Antonio, fifth generation mm -hmm. Mexican-American. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned in, in one of your interviews that the organization Upward Bound uh, mm -hmm. really saved your life. Can you touch on that a little bit? Not only Upward Bound, but community organizations like APM in, in San Antonio. There was something called the, uh, the Good Samaritan Center in, in, my, in my barrio. There was something you might remember back in the 70s, 60s, and 70s. There was an organization called the Neighborhood Youth Organization. Oh, yeah. It was a yes. government program uh, that gave us opportunities to, to, to move out of, uh, out of the barrio. The church played a big role in my life. Uh, we played baseball, and, you know, that kept me out of trouble because there were so many issues with drugs and crime. Um, but uh, Upward Bound, man, you know, they came along uh, in the 70s when I was in high school, and they selected kids from the inner city. The program was pretty simple. The theory was that the way out of poverty is through education. What a thought, right? And the government gave you extra courses on Saturdays. They picked 10 students from every high school mostly in the inner cities across America. It's still in existence today. It's in Philadelphia, too. Uh, and they, they picked, I don't know what they saw in me, but they picked me, and my grades weren't that great. Uh, but they saw a spark or a glimmer of hope. And uh, I was one of the Upward Bound students. They gave us extra courses in math, biology, and English. Uh, and then they gave, let us go to college for six weeks and live on a college campus during high school. For a first-generation college kid, this was a huge deal. It showed me what the possibilities might be like. Because when I was picking tomatoes in, in Ohio at the age of 13, my father, I'll never forget being on my knees on the cold, hard ground one morning, looking at a row of tomato plants for a young 13-year-old boy's eyes seemed to go on for miles and miles. And, and, and that's what I had to look forward to that day. And my father, Bruno, looking down saying, Juanito, you want to do this kind of work for the rest of your life? Or do you want to get a college education someday? It was a no-brainer. I knew I didn't want to do that kind of back-breaking work for the rest of my life, but no one believed in me, Brian. You no, know, when I came back to school in San Antonio after picking cherries in Michigan and tomatoes in Ohio, I would ask my teachers, how do I prepare for the SATs? How do I prepare for the ACTs or, or get advanced placement classes in math, biology, and English? Do you know what my own teachers at the age of 14 would tell me? They would say, John, it's wonderful that you have this dream of someday being a television reporter. Because I wanted to be the reporter since I was 13. I used to watch Geraldo Rivera in 2020. I wanted to be right. like an right? right. Puerto, Puerto, Puerto Rican, right? right. Uh, but my own teachers would say, you know, that's great that you have this dream, but we think you should try wood shop or metal shop or auto mechanics. Not that there's anything wrong with those great trades, but I wanted to go to college. And my own teachers and my own counselors before Upward Bound they did what people do on that show, What Would You Do, every Friday night. They judged me by the color of my skin and the accent in my voice. But thank God for my mother, Maria. Man. She also was the one who kept pushing and pushing. When I was embarrassed to wear the same clothes to school every you know, day, she would say, Mijo, my son, Mijo, you know, don't be embarrassed. We wash your clothes, right? You wear the same clothes every other day, but they're clean, right? And then when I was embarrassed to take refried bean tacos for lunch in tortillas, 
And I was embarrassed. And my mother would say, mijo, don't be embarrassed about having to take bean and tortilla tacos when all the other kids are taking their fancy bologna and white bread. She would say, don't be embarrassed. What, what matters is what's in here in your brain. And what, of course, what's in here in your corazón. So she kept me going. She was my hero. But then along came Upward Bound and made it happen. Made, let me go to college. Yeah. John, I, I, that, those are fantastic stories. I said we could talk all afternoon. I know oh, we're running short on. I know we're running short on time, but oh, uh, yeah. what, what's what's next on your schedule so we can look out for it? If you could just share that with us. Uh, in a couple of days, I'm going to go to San Antonio in Corpus Christi in Texas, uh, and I'm interviewing uh, Selena's family. You know, the the great yeah. uh, Mexican American Tejano singer who tragically died. 25 years. So we're doing an anniversary piece on her on her death. And I'm going to interview the man she married, Chris Pettis, who was her guitar player. If you saw the movie with Jennifer Lopez, you remember that. Uh, Netflix is doing a multi-part series on her life also uh, coming up in December. So for Good Morning America, I'm going to be doing several stories uh, before Thanksgiving. I don't know the exact dates. Uh, where you will see me talking to not only her husband, but her father, Mr. Quintanilla, and her mother and her sister, Suzette. So I'm looking forward to that, especially because 25 years ago, I was there when, when Selena was killed and did a story for 20. I'll be doing many other 2020 stories uh, before we started wrapping up for What Would You Do Again? Fantastic. Well, I can't wait to start filming again for one. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you, Gracias, for being here with us uh, oh, today man. and spending some time with us. If you hadn't had a chance to read John's books, they're fantastic. I didn't get a uh, chance to mention The Heroes Among Us, but that's another yeah. great book of yours, John. I have them all. So uh, thank, you, thank you for what you do. And we're so proud to have you where you are. So thank you very thank much. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure, that, Brian. Thank you. Absolutely. I'll turn it over to our next uh, Rose Gray. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you Honored for guests. joining us. Well, I will say ACM this. My phone, my text, community my emails are coming in. People are crying. Ray. People are touched. People are saying, yes, we can. See, si safe when they. We can change the world. Um, so, you know, it's it's amazing. So thank both of you. Uh, and John, thanks for telling us your personal story and for framing the conversation to come with that powerful clip. The clip reminds us of the importance of keeping the conversation of race, inequality, and gentrification in the forefront. Many of us on this call are recommitting ourselves to this mission. So again, it was, it was a powerful story that needed to be told in these times. John and Brian are going to come back and join us for the second segment, but now I have the pleasure of introducing our other panelists, Councilwoman Maria Quinones and friend Venezuelas. You know Councilman Quinones uh, Sanchez, many of you on this call. She is a veteran activist in the trenches, over 30 years committing to the city of Philadelphia and our community. She is in her fourth term, four-year term, uh, as councilwoman for the seventh district. She has many legislative accomplishments, the land bank, which we love. Uh, she, she initiated the tax foreclosure reform, the AVI assistance for vulnerable homeowners, our loop program, the owner occupied program, a property tax deferral program that is helping our seniors to name a few. But most recently, she is leading the charge with her colleagues on working on new legislation that will provide over $400 million of an investment in affordable housing, poverty reduction, and job creation. So we can't wait to hear maybe a little bit of her personal story, as well as the new legislation that she and her colleagues are working on. And our dear friend, Fred. Fred currently serves as the Community Investment Manager at the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh, but he has a rich background in community and economic development. He served as the Vice President of the Harrisburg Housing Authority, Director, of the housing, Director for Housing Management for the Dolphin County Housing Authority, and he was President and CEO for the Alliance for Building Community, CDC, one of our colleagues out there. 
Uh, today, Fred's going to share his thoughts, his experiences as it relates to today's topic. And he will remind us that something's most important when I was speaking to him a little time ago. When you're creating public policy, you got to be at the table because if you're not at the table, you understand the problems in your community. You reflect your community. You need to be at that table. So I'm really excited to welcome our panelists and let's get on with the show. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Rose. Thank you. And welcome to our, our panelists. Thank you this afternoon for, for joining us. And we're going to get right into it. So uh, uh, I have a questions I'd like to give the panelists an opportunity to answer. But uh, Councilwoman uh, Quinona Sanchez, I'm going to start with you. Good uh, afternoon. We, good afternoon. Felicidades to the APM family. And thank you to all of the folks contributing on this wonderful uh, anniversary. Gracias a todos. <laughs> Ustedes, I want to thank John Quinones, el primo, <laughs> yes. for the presentation on, on race. I don't think there's a more important time in our, in our nation's history as we talk about poverty and some of these issues as it is now. And all of us that are in these spaces where we have an opportunity to amplify in the most positive ways what is going on and the opportunities that exist. So thank you. I look forward to participating in the discussion. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you and I, uh, Councilwoman, have worked together on many projects in the district and throughout Philadelphia, for that matter. You've been supportive of projects all over. Um, as you look at the changes that occurred in the neighborhoods, uh, what is your number one concern uh, for your uh, neighborhoods? I think in a COVID world, you know, post Floyd, I think we need to be unapologetic about what we need to do, be very focused and intentional about the policies, some which have been hostile to working class communities in which we work in. And I think we need to change the narrative. You know, many times, and I'm chair of appropriations now because of my seniority, when we're doing tax cuts, robust, you know, Bateman, we call it an investment. And then when I start talking about what we need to do in the neighborhood, all of a sudden, it becomes an expense. And I think those of us in these spaces really need to change that narrative and say, investing in working class communities is a win-win for every city, for every neighborhood. Diverse mixed income neighborhoods are not gonna happen if we're not really, really focused on what we need to do to facilitate that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Fred Benuelos, uh, Fred, uh, would you like to add to that? Yeah, so um, uh, Brian, I think that that some of the things that, that we could take a look at is, um, you know, targeting more intentionally, you know, some of these uh, census tracts that, that are minority, um, that are minority um, uh, based, um, pre predominantly minority based, and um, uh, start developing policies around how we could develop in those in those census tracts. Um, that's going to start making making a difference. Um, I know that we we target low income census tracts sometimes, but I don't think we've ever looked at it from a minority standpoint and looking at the at the actual numbers and start targeting th those areas. And Fred, since you know you you touched on that, what positive aspects have you seen changes that we could probably use more of, for instance, uh, in those communities? Anything positive that you can point to? Yeah, yeah, and thank you, Brian. And I forgot my last question to um, uh, congratulate APM, and, and also, you know, th this is such an honor to be on with, with, with great panelists here. Uh, I feel like I'm bringing those guys down. Usually, usually I'm the only Mexican on the panel. Now I'm the other Mexican. <laughs> on the panel. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. so, so, Brian, um, to, to get back to the to, to the to the question. I think it's our unsung heroes um, that, that, that we could point to in, in positive. And, and I'm talking about precisely about the APMs of the world, the nonprofit affordable housing developer, developer corporations, um, and your public housing authorities. Um, they really get no play through all this. But throughout all this time, they've quietly been in the background providing services to our people, uh, maybe not getting um, uh, you know, all the accolades that they deserve, but they're, they're, they're out there and, and they're working. And um, uh, they're they're serving the under the underserved. We are disproportionately represented in housing authorities and in and in these types of um, uh, housing projects. And they're there providing us those services and helping us get ahead. And they're not just providing housing; they're providing other services. They're providing employment services. They're applying. They're um, providing educational type um, services that are really helping to to shape the person, not just house the person. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And, and Councilwoman, I know that, you know, you've done some positive things. I mean, what would you like to see more of? I mean, we're going to talk about uh, funding in a bit, but Councilwoman Quinones, what would you like to see? Again, going back to the narrative, there are resilient people in these neighborhoods, right? And I think, um, you know, to Fred's point, organizations who have been, who've gone into neighborhoods where no one else wanted to go in, and really opened up and, and uh, the opportunities that exist. But, you know, we forget the people that live here. You know, I have to come downtown and be a cheerleader for very challenging neighborhoods. But, you know, I can think of all, every day from the top of my head, those women that I meet um, that are resilient on their blocks, the, 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 you know, the block captains, the people that just do the work. And, I, and again, when we're doing this work, we forget that these communities are resilient. They lived through very tough times and they created communities community, um, created nuances to, to who we are. Philadelphia is a city of neighborhoods and it has a bunch of idiosyncrasies, but those are, that is the strength of what we have in, in, in Philadelphia. And I think when we're talking about these issues, we look at people as numbers and not people and life stories um, that really reflect um, the values that we have as a country. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, John, you mentioned that you get back to San Antonio uh, pretty regular. Have you noticed changes in your old neighborhood and are they positive, negative? What have you been seeing there? Uh, thank you, Brian. You know, I am in awe of, uh, of what maybe Prima, the councilwoman, uh, just said, and, and, and of course, Fred, because uh, I think that example can be taken to other cities in America, places like Chicago and, and, and San Antonio. And of course, you know, it's South Texas, McAllen and Brownsville, Texas. When I go back, Despite the great work that we all know Henry Cisneros, uh, a good friend of mine, the former mayor, the former HUD secretary, then got involved heavily into low-income housing and providing an opportunity for folks to, to, to move to more mixed neighborhoods in a new house for the very first time. Uh, we never had that as a kid growing up. You know, we, you know, uh, my parents sold their house when they passed away. We had to sell their home. And then we realized they hadn't paid the property taxes in like 20 years. Uh, we had to pay it because they couldn't afford it. Uh, some things have changed in San Antonio, thanks to Henry Cisneros' efforts and then Julian Castro, who was also a mayor in San Antonio. Uh, but so much remains the same. And that's why I want you guys to export uh, what you're doing in Philadelphia. I just wish we could, we could mimic that elsewhere because the barrio is still the barrio. I was down there filming for another story in San Antonio and nothing has changed. In fact, so much of it has gotten worse. Uh, flooding is an issue. The schools are, 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 are all, it's all based on property taxes. If you have low values in a community, you're gonna get poor equipment, teachers, et cetera. And it keeps Mexicanos in the same boat uh, ha that I was in. You know, my only savior, as you mentioned, was upward bound. So uh, my only hope is you guys can support what you're doing there uh, because we need it. The rest of the country needs it. Absolutely. We, we had a saying amongst the states, we don't compete with each other. So we all used to try to mimic other programs yeah. that were successful in other states. And yeah. I hope that uh, continues to grow uh, across states and whatever it takes to help those communities in need. Um, we have a new administration coming in. Uh, and I am working on a wish list that will include funding. Funding is always the key critical source because we need uh, homes, CDBG, uh, vouchers, all of those pieces to serve those that we do. Aside from funding, you know, what changes or improvement can be made to affordable housing and economic development to those communities in need? I mean, John, you see it in San Antonio. So uh, mixed income communities is, is one example. Uh, Councilwoman, you spoke about that, but what other things can be done uh, to help those communities in need? Well, I think policy has to be very, very focused on this stuff. I think in cities like Philadelphia that have generational poverty and deep poverty in certain situations, everything we do for how we assess properties for too long, we've assessed, you know, the, the house over the land. And that's created a sense of every time we invest, it means a property tax increase. When I have a senior 
who comes to me and says, Maria, I got to move out the neighborhood because you're putting a new supermarket up and you're going to tax me out. I mean, our policies are hostile to, to working class communities all over the country and, and particularly in cities like Philadelphia. So, you know, from a city perspective is changing the way we look at assessments and investments in our neighborhoods. From a state perspective, you know, Brian, having been at the state, we have the tools that we have are blunt sometimes and we're not being flexible with the toolbox we have about what preservation looks like, how do we incentivize it um, in neighborhoods so that we're restoring them and again, not taxing and moving people out. On the federal level, yeah, let's get our wish list together. I mean, I think at the federal level, how HUD funds, the fact that they eliminated programs like 202 that helped our seniors, you know, prevailing wage and how, you know, it forces some of the, the issues around what we build um, at both at the state and the federal level. Again, these are hostile policies that we really want to make sure that people who have family sustaining jobs can choose neighborhoods and that we can have them be mixed income and that everybody uh, can prosper together. And we have to get the private sector to understand that their bottom line is based on the prosperity of every neighborhood in all the cities in which they invest in. Absolutely. Uh, Fred, uh, would you like to add to that? Sure. So, uh, Brian, I think that in all levels of government, this is an opportunity, and precisely now with, with the federal government, and where there's three areas that we really need to be more, more inclusive of. And that's in hiring, procurement, and then most importantly is on being on represented on boards and commissions. So not unlike corporate America, where they have boards, there's also boards and commissions that oversee and set policy, um, such as what um, uh, Councilwoman Quinones just mentioned. And we need to be included in, in those talks and included on, in, in those commissions and boards. That's going to help shape the policy, and that's going to help us uh, hear our, our voice. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, uh, low income housing tax credit program, you know, uh, we've been lobbying for years for that to be increased. So that's one of the uh, resources that's on the list, looking for a, a 50% increase there. Um, and I know that's uh, we're oversubscribed. We're funding one out of every three properties that application that gets submitted. The PHFA, and that's not unique to Pennsylvania. That happens across the country. Fred, uh, with the Home Loan Bank, you have the AHP program. Can you talk about that a little bit and, and how that works, for instance? Sure. So the affordable housing program is, is again, um, a, a, a grant program from the Federal Home Loan Bank. All federal home loan banks have them. Um, there, there's a policy in where they're required to set, up, set aside 10% of their net earnings, and it goes to the development of affordable housing. But not unlike what you just mentioned, Brian, we are oversubscribed. Last year, we had $30 million um, worth of grants to put out in the streets, and we had applications totaling over $80 million. So there is a sore need for affordable housing funding, and it can't just be the same funding sources all the time. We need to find other funding sources in other ways. I, I agree. And yeah, another one I'll mention is the National Housing Trust Fund. That's funded by a portion of Fannie and Freddie's profit, 0.4%. Percent, which is, you know, Pennsylvania, just to put it in perspective, Pennsylvania gets $5 million for that. So that doesn't go very far. You know, we need funding on a national level that's in the billions across the country, uh, quite truthfully. Uh, and with that, I guess, uh, uh, Councilwoman, with the city and the needs there, is there talk of having uh, a, a separate funding source that would supplement these? And I know that's a, that's a big issue at the council level, but you know, I've talked to a number of council members, including yourself, that, you know, you continue to advocate for this. Uh, what's your thoughts on that at the at the city level? I think we have to look at it comprehensively. You know, we've set up and we have and we've been nationally recognized for some of the support programs we have as I'm the author of UBA, which is an income based tax program. I'm the author of TAB, which is water affordability for those of us who think water is a right. I think governments really have to look within themselves and say, what are we doing to facilitate the reality of who we serve as a constituency and be unapologetic of the, again, of those types of investments that we have to make in, in the neighborhood. You know, we fought for a hundred million dollars in new investment in, in the housing trust fund here locally. We created a sub fund and we believe in public private partnerships and trying to, to enhance that. But, you know, again, I think as a government, 
we have to be more focused around poverty elimination. You know, for the last year, I've been um, mm -hmm. facilitating a conversation with subject experts, and we're this week in city council will approve the establishment of a poverty fund. And again, be really unapologetic about the types of investment we have to make in people, not just programs, right? Yeah. Talked about basic income, stuff that before in the past, we, you know, you mentioned that people thought were crazy and we gotta stop thinking poor people don't know how to make wise decisions. Okay. With support, right? We can really move in the case of Philadelphia where we have 400,000 people in poverty, we can move 100,000 people with real, short-term investments and in getting them through that line and then advocating for those values around family sustaining jobs and you know I, you know i appreciate fred the banker here we got to get banks to really invest and stop redlining our neighborhoods you know and when they come invest they'll come invest in south kensington and look i believe that the apm geography is going to be a national model for how we invest in those neighborhoods and keep that mixed income but it's not happening by itself it's happening because of my work it's happening because of apm's work but banks have to come in and when they come in they can't be investing in the white applicants they have to be investing in the residents that are there and so you know i'd like to see some more federal guidelines around and guidance around this you know we haven't had a good cra law lawsuit in a while and you know those are the kind of discussions we need to have so that fred is, is not oversubscribed so you're not oversubscribed but banks are really um, investing in those in those uh, commercial uh, products. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, the Opportunity Zone was created uh, and everyone, you know, I got excited at first too, that it's gonna go affordable housing. There's not been one affordable housing project. It's not for done, us. Un, it's, it's not, not for, for us. us. And, it is and they're knocking on- national money that does not care yes. about what is going on. And those projects would have been done without the Opportunity Zone additional kick, if you will. Uh, that was the low hanging fruit. It just it, nothing came into affordable housing, which kind of frustrated me even even more. And I go back to something you said about investing in our people. And I've never been afraid to take those risks. And after the Great Recession, educated people were signing mortgage documents they didn't understand. We had to get, we had to start a counseling network. And I'm sure there's some members of the counseling agencies in the audience. As I look at the national funding for that across the country, it's fifty three million dollars which is nothing, <laughs> it's not enough. Uh, Pre-counseling, post-counseling, uh, foreclosure eviction, that number should be up in the 250, a quarter billion easily. So we're gonna lobby to, to make sure that uh, that happens and, and to get it affordable housing notice where it should be. Um, uh, John, I have a question for you. Uh, examples or, or communities that you can point to that are doing some things right or are, are, are in pretty bad shape uh, either way that you would like to touch on? Well, I, I leave it up to you guys. You guys are the experts on housing. I haven't done that many stories. I've done some stories along the U.S.-Mexico border where people who work at NAFTA plants uh, on the Mexican side of the border, but also bleeding over to the American side, uh, are having horrific, horrific problems with housing. And as I sit here listening to you all, I, I say to myself, you know, the media needs to step in and shine a light on many of these issues, both good and bad. I just read a statistic that said 40% of Latino home buyers in the state of Illinois face some sort of racial discrimination. 40%, that's almost half. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon the national media and in your communities, WPBI, which is our affiliate in, in Philly, uh, should be uh, doing stories uh, that illuminate what's going on. But again, both the good and the bad. I'm thinking here, maybe we should be doing a what would you do scenario of uh, you have an open house and yeah. somebody walks in and they're Latino and the saleswoman starts saying things like the realtor starts saying things like, well, there are not too many Latinos in this neighborhood or there's no Catholic church nearby or, you know, they don't celebrate, you know, Cinco de Mayo here, whatever right. we would have to do, again, to shine a light on this issue of discrimination in housing. Um, I see journalism, I call it the candle in the darkness. Imagine that you're in a room where it's pitch dark, it's the middle of the night, there's been a storm, the electricity's out, we're stumbling around, we can't see the hand, our hands in front of our faces. Well, the journalist, he or she, 
is the person with the little candle or the little flashlight, and they can shine it on the darkest corners of the world to illuminate injustice, to illuminate human rights violations and civil rights violations and discrimination. I think when journalism is done right, those are the kinds of stories we should be doing, and we should be focusing on a lot of what you're talking about. No, oh, absolutely. Well, we, we'd love to help you do an episode on that. Yeah, <laughs> it's like going on that yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Part yes. Of, yeah. <laughs> you 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 can definitely participate. You know, uh, <laughs> Councilwoman, you you talked about a while back redlining, and that brought to my mind back in the '90s, uh, PHFA. We realized that redlining was happening in parts of Philadelphia, quite truthfully. Uh, so we created a an insurance fund uh, to do mortgages in that area. Twenty three percent, twenty five percent of our mortgage production comes from inner city in the Philadelphia. Uh, we showed a lot of private institutions how to make money still lending to that. And then they tried to force us out of the business. Our premium was lower uh, and mm -hmm. the great recession hit. We weren't allowed to do business with a lot of them, but there's a way to do business and serve those in need. And I think we're going to we're going to get back to that. We're going to show them how just how to do that. Uh, and you, John, you're right. I think the media needs to get involved because, you mm -hmm. know, I had no problem being a catalyst doing those type of things. And and putting our capital at risk uh, because yeah. I couldn't just go ask for money, but it did work. And that's the problem. I wanted to show them that it does work, John, you know, so I absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's right. why I think it's important, Brian, that we, the narrative has to be, there's a win-win in this, right? That's Investing right. in these communities, you could, you can increase your bottom line. You could, you know, there's, we just, those of us in these spaces have to be I continue to be as aggressive and, you know, NILDA and APM are definitely aggressive and have demonstrated capacity, um, much more capacity than most of these organizations, but we should be very direct about what our expectations are. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you, like you said, you can show uh, a win-win. We're going to ask for 50% uh, more in the tax credits. I have to get NILDA and Rose Gray more tax credit. They're just, you know, <laughs> busting at the seams. They got a lot of projects <laughs> in the pipeline, so I got to get them funded. Uh, but uh, if you recall, the tax credit program was to bring private equity to the table. Had a steep learning curve. Folks said, oh, we want to use that program. But guess what? Now it's oversubscribed. It does work. And we have some fantastic uh, projects. We've made the connection between healthcare and housing, uh, having medical facilities mm -hmm. to them. So that's, you know, that's, that's the way it should work, you know, bringing that partnership. Healthcare, housing goes together. Uh, housing's always been at the bottom end of of the appropriation, let's say, on a national basis, we're going to change that. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. I know that, but I, I think it's a, a great initiative. Uh, Fred, is there anything coming down the pike on the from the bank level? I know you have a federal regulator that you deal with that controls the HP, but any changes that uh, the bank system is contemplating there? So, so um, uh, for the on, on behalf of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh, one of the things that that we've just recently completed was a housing needs assessment for our footprint, and of course we encompass Pennsylvania, Delaware, and West Virginia. And um, uh, one of the things that we found um, as a need or a necessity is to be more inclusive. And we're we're writing um, within our policies right now. We're taking a look at how we could do a better job, how we could target some of our funds, how we could be the catalyst for that change. Um, but again, it's going to take every community, it's going to take the other federal home loan banks to follow suit and to start looking at this as well, so that we could really start being making an impact um, in the communities that we serve. And, and I know HP is tied to your income, Fred, the 10 percent. But I mean, would they be thinking about any flexibility with that with regards to the income streams um, amongst the 11 banks now in the system? Um, so one of the things, Brian, um, because of the pandemic, I'm sure that, that, that other banks are experiencing some, some earnings, um, yeah. not that they may, may not be where they were pre COVID. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, one of the things that the federal home loan bank of Pittsburgh does do though, is it has discretionary funding and it has other programs, um, right. that, that help as well. So one of the ones that, that we did that we're very, very proud of is, um, uh, the home for good program that tackles mm -hmm. the issue of homelessness. Yeah. Um, again, that that's all with um, uh, discretionary funding from our board. It's not not a requirement. So they really stepped up and and provided this funding in a time of need. Um, the banking on business, which helps some um, uh, small businesses get up and running. Yeah. So so we have other programs and we're trying to meet all of the community's needs th through any one of our community programs. Oh, no, that's that's great. You've been a great partner to uh, 
to our our, our CDCs across the uh, uh, Commonwealth also, Fred, and to PHFA also, so thank you. Uh, Councilwoman, uh, you know, one of the things that I know when I speak to uh, developers, they talk about, you know, zoning issues and how fast they can get through the pipeline, uh, particularly at the city level. Um, is there thoughts or, and I know the consideration, some of the other council members are looking at trying to uh, fast track affordable housing project. Where do we stand with that now at the uh, city level? One of the things that COVID has really forced us to do, and we've been working with the real estate market as we've you know, expanded the eviction moratorium and other things, we really have to look within government and figure out how we are creating obstacles to that affordability and that development community. I actually chaired the uh, an internal working group to restart our construction or our development that included our zoning, our planning, our, our law department and said, folks, how do we get out the way, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and get people back working. Um, and in those discussions, we quickly found out that we have too many regulatory issues. You know, for small businesses, there's 157 steps to start a business in the city mm -hmm. of Philadelphia. Um, we have many departments that are involved and we need to be more focused on streamlining that. You know, we've, and we've taken all, you know, we've put some regulatory uh, things to rest in, in the recovery and what we're calling a smarter recovery. But we have found that we really do have to go back from what do we charge for renter license for people in the affordability market? You know, payment plans for real estate owners who are, you know, caught up in the moratorium piece and making sure that we're giving them access to payment plans so that particularly in that space, small landlords in the city of Philadelphia, 70% of them own less than 10 units. 30% of them are people of color who may have inherited the first property, right? They're not getting mortgage forbearance. They're not getting all of those things. So we're having those discussions. And I think COVID has really um, highlighted the fact that there's so much stuff that we have on the books that, uh, you know, we want to protect public safety and government has a role to ensure that people are living in quality, affordable housing and all of those things. But there's so much, so many, so much bureaucracy involved. There's too many people checking the box not connecting the box. And I think right. you're going to see um, us in government really looking at that. We had a business regulatory um, work group before that I was a member of, along with one of my council colleagues. We have to do that in all of these spaces because we're going to be in this recovery mode for at least the next 18 to 24 months. And it's really an opportunity to look at what are we requiring the private sector to do Many times we require the private sector to do what we don't do. And then we burden right? The right. nonprofit development affordable uh, network, because we're asking them to do what the private market is doing. And then at a cost sometimes to ourselves, right? And in, in trying to build this affordability. So there's a lot of space. And I think you're going to see a lot of energy around that and people really thinking uh, outside the box. I know in our poverty plan, we have some really good pilots that I look forward to launching as part of this new, you know, I called it the black stimulus, but this new $400 million neighborhood inv investment that you're gonna see uh, over the next six months. Very good, thank you, thank you. I know that uh, we have some questions that are coming in uh, from the audience that we wanna get to. So uh, first of all, I wanna thank uh, our, our panelists, but let's, uh, let's take a look at the questions. Question number one. Uh, Mr. Quinones, thank you very much yeah. for uh, being with us today. Um, I just wanted to ask you, why do so many Americans believe that we are foreigners, that Latinos uh, don't come from this country? And how come there is such an animosity towards Latinos in the United States? Thank you, and uh, thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you for the question. I, I just, they don't know their history. You know, people forget, you know, they think they were the first ones here. Uh, my family, the Quinoneses, have been in Texas for five to seven generations. Uh, uh, people don't know the history that Texas was once part of Mexico and part of Spain. And so was California, Arizona, Nuevo Mexico, Colorado you know, Utah, parts of Wyoming, uh, that was all part of Mexico. I, I love it today when people come up to me and say, John Quinones, you're Mexican-American. When did you cross the border and come to the U.S.? It's like, we were always here. You know, I tell them, I didn't cross the border. The border crossed me. 
Uh, but it, it happens, and I don't know how we fix it. It's it's embedded in our in our DNA. This thing where you discriminate and you judge people based on the way they look. And the experts will tell you that it's embedded from the days when we lived in caves. You know when. We have to worry about going out our cave and finding out what might eat us or what we might have for dinner. And that's why we're very cagey when we meet someone. We size them up. And we all do it by the way they look, the color of their skin. and you know. So we have to work on it. The experts also tell you that if you stop yourself before you presume the worst of someone, less likely to be so judgmental. But it happens to even me today. You know, I was at the airport the other day before COVID, and I was getting ready to go to New York, and I was lucky enough to be flying in first class. And I'm standing there in line, and I was in the first class line to get on board the plane. When I look to my left, all the other first class passengers, by mistake, have lined up in the economy line. It happens. It's okay. But I was the first one. I was in the right place. And when I'm standing there, this lady looked at me, and I was wearing a baseball cap and T-shirt and jeans. and you know, I didn't look like me, I don't think, <laughs> and, uh, on t- the me on television anyway. And this woman looked over and she said, sir, are you even in first class? And I just looked up at the sign and I nodded. I didn't say a word. And she said, well, the first class passengers are over here. And I pointed to the sign that said first class for me, but I didn't want to argue. So I went to the back of the line with, with the rest of the first class passengers. What did I care? Former migrant migrant farm worker. I'm lucky to be flying at all. But on my way back to the back of the line, this mean white lady yelled out, the announcement was made in English. We speak English in America, presuming that I didn't. And other Mm. people in line who recognized me from what would you do said, John, is this a what would you do scenario? (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) like, oh, uh, it's real life. And as, as I'm standing in the back of the line, my only concern was that I was going to have to sit next to this mean lady on the plane. But I got on the plane and no, she was by herself, by the window, and I couldn't resist. And as I walked to my seat, I leaned over to her and I said, you know, man, my name is John Quinones, and I do this TV show called What Would You Do? And you would be perfect for the show. You could play the part of the racist. <laughs> She gave me another dirty look, and that was the end of it. But I tell you, man, yeah, you're right. Uh, People still presume the worst based on the way we look and that other language that we speak. We have to work on it. Progress is being made. I'm encouraged by by some things, but we still have a lot of work to do. Yes, we do. We do, John. Um, Question number two. I'm Jennifer Rodriguez, President and CEO of the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. My question is, the mass majority of Latino-owned businesses in Philadelphia and the region are consumer-based commercial quarter type of businesses like restaurants, dry cleaners, and hair salons. And these are also the most impacted by COVID-19. Very few of them have an online presence. From your perspective, What types of programs, resources, and policies can be implemented to ensure that these businesses and our commercial quarters survive this crisis? Thank you. Maria, you want to start with that one? Yeah, and I want to thank Jennifer for all the work that they do. You know, this notion and and policy making and investment to those that are too big to fail, right? We are so quick to bail out the airlines, to bear to to bail out the banks, and then these small businesses that are essential, right? All of a sudden, they became essential during the pandemic. Um, we have just put them through hoops and hoops to get whatever you know benefits or or loans or grants that, that that were available and again i think we are in a different time and hopefully with a different direction in in terms of our federal leadership where access to capital you know jennifer has been a great advocate for that real access to capital again Again, CRA lawsuit in the making. Banks need to invest in this stuff. And we've learned, you know, I've, I've had an opportunity to participate in some trainings and workshops of pension funds. How do we get pension funds to invest in these small businesses, right? People who can afford to sit on some of this money for a little bit um, and, re- and have a good, you know, return on investment. We've seen product lines created for immigrant 
uh, populations have the best um, repayment schedules, right? You know, we've seen this. So the investment world, again, has to be held to a standard, particularly all those industries, as, as Fred mentioned before, who we procure. I put out a challenge to the business community in Philadelphia, and I said, I don't want to talk to you if you don't tell me who's on the board, who you're doing business with, who you employ, what do you, and you know, like check yourself, all right? Mm -hmm. And tell right. me what you're gonna do. We saw it in Pepsi saying, we're gonna put $500 million in the street and we, you were gonna recognize it. We saw it in Netflix saying, we're bad at this business. I think this is the time for us to hold uh, these institutions. But those core small businesses who because of our tax policy are not always reporting what they should, they should, they're family owned, you know, they're not carrying the payrolls because it's the family that that's operating. We have to change that. We have to get folks to come out of those networks and really invest in them. There's a return on <laughs> investment. And if that's all people understand is their bottom line, these investments in Hispanic businesses, Hispanic women businesses have all proved to be profitable. Absolutely. Uh, Fred, anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so um, uh, I, I've seen, and, and COVID really threw a curveball to, to, to all of these businesses, and it's been horrible, but I've seen um, uh, certain, certain things be relaxed, like parking restrictions um, to enable the folks to come downtown. Um, the other thing is a, a lot of the businesses that, that um, uh, Jennifer mentioned um, are supported by the local community. So, so when you um, provide housing in the direct area, they're going to be your natural consumers, and those businesses are going to have a better opportunity to thrive. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, when it, 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 and it all comes back down to planning. Um, so I think that once we take a look clearly, who are those businesses serving? Can we create the market for them there through policy? Can we create that change? I think that they're going to do a better job um, in, in the longer run. But unfortunately, we're like in the middle of it now. So, you know, this is like turning a ship and it's very, very difficult um, to, to get to respond quickly enough. Yeah, and, and, and I will add that uh, under the CARES Act, there was like 125 million dedicated to minority business, which is clearly not enough. I'm optimistic that under the HEROES, uh, that number needs to triple to minority businesses. So stay tuned, uh, that, will, that process has begun already. And when it gets to the state level, we gotta lobby even more to don't hamstring it so that these businesses have access to that capital. So. Not only do we have to get the number up at the federal level, but we got to make sure that it doesn't come with a lot of uh, restrictions, let's say, at the state level to it gets to the mm -hmm. right businesses in need. And I think we can we can do that, uh, but we got to be diligent about it. Absolutely. Thank you. So, Brian, one, one of the other things, though, is we need a repository of information as well, because some of the smaller mom and pop shops that, that, that are out there that are struggling to survive, they don't know how to access some of these grants that are out there. Um, you know, some of the banks, PNC is going to, um, is about to make a huge commitment to um, the, the black community and, and not enough people know they're, they're, that information isn't there. It's kind of, it reminds me, you know, when I was in high school, they said, Hey, there's a whole bunch of scholarship for Latinos. Well, guess what? I didn't know where any of them were and I didn't get not a one. Um, right. So we got to make that information available and make it useful um, to the folks that could really need it. Good point, Fred. Good point. Uh, we've got time for one more question. Hi, this is Palayo Cole. Um, my question is, is Philadelphia is quickly uh, gentrifying. How do we best control the displacement of longtime residents when revitalization of a neighborhood is occurring? What are regulatory, administrative, and other tools uh, that can be used to keep revitalization going, but at the same time not displace longtime residents. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Maria, I'll start with you again, Councilwoman. Yeah, again, I, again, I, I'm going to say 8 p.m. We're going to have this conversation at the student's <laughs> anniversary, and the 8 p.m. footprint is going to be one of the best examples of mixed income um, development in, in the country, right? This, and But it won't happen by accident. I think that there are policies, that I talked about our assessment policy in the city of Philadelphia. We have a robust tax abatement program, but we penalize in our assessment long-term residents because we spread the value out, right? So there's policies that are hostile to long-term residents 
residents who are on fixed income. And I think government should not be in the business of displacing people, but our policies do when we're not equitable in how we, we are doing the, this policy. I think some of the other things is, you know, some of this stuff has to happen um, in a very intentional way. I just passed the, the most aggressive mandatory affordable housing and on American Street Carter that's adjacent to the APM market. There's going to be a thousand units built on American Street. 200 of those are going to be affordable. That didn't happen by itself. It happened because we said that. We're about to uh, unveil in the next couple of weeks one of the most aggressive, um, intentional, vacant land transitions into affordable housing in the same footprint. Policies have to be in place to make that happen, but then the investment needs to come. I know APM and some of the other partners on the ground have capacity to do this well, but if I can't get them the resources, and again, the toolbox can't be blunt. It has to be flexible. How do we look at home ownership differently? You know, when my parents bought their home in 1974 for $12,000 at a 16% interest rate um, in Hunting Park, it's a different market. There was 70% home ownership in Philadelphia. We're now going down to almost 50%. You know, our home first program here in the city of Philadelphia has turned hundreds of people into homeowners by giving them grants for first time homeowners. That is not going to happen by accident. And, and again, this is when government needs to facilitate, invest appropriately, get out of the way when we need to, and respect the stakeholders and the folks on the ground. I think too many times we do this and we don't listen to the communities um, that, that we're investing in. And we want folks, look, I have neighbors, I live in Norris Square, who cash out. I'm not gonna tell my neighbor not to cash out um, in their, for their property, and, but I want them to know that their equity also can help them in their retirement, right? So how we do financial in your properties. I want people to cash out because they want to, not because they have to. And I want people to invest in these neighborhoods. You know, when I moved to Second and Diamond 25 years ago, my, my family and friends thought I was crazy in the neighborhood that I'm moving in. And now everybody, it's a neighborhood of choice because again, the work of CDCs like APM and building that framework for us to have a more balanced neighborhood approach. Thank, thank you, uh, Councilwoman. I appreciate that. Um, let's uh, wrap up comments. Uh, Fred, I'll start with you. Well, look, I'm just thrilled to be a, a part of this panel, and I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to meet both Councilwoman M Maria Quinones and John Quinones and Brian uh -huh. as an old friend. Uh, I, I really thank you for the questions, and, and I really appreciate the fact that you did not ask me what I would do. Because that's just... <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Maria, can I get a wrap up from you? I'm sorry. Maria? Yes, again, I'm just happy to be part of the celebration, happy to be with El Primo John and invite him down yeah. to Philadelphia, whether you're <laughs> filming or not, Vente, we, we welcome you here. Um, to, the, uh, to the extended uh, uh, APM family, the sponsors, the funders, thank you for investing when you did. Many of you have been there from the beginning. Um, and you know, this year has been hard. It's been hard for all uh, nonprofit organizations. Your support is even more valuable at this particular time. So hang in there with APM, continue to invest in neighborhoods and the people that they serve. Gracias. Ab absolutely. Uh, and, and our special guest, uh, John Quinones. John. Oh, I want you all to always act as if John Quinones is in the next room, because that, that is the true test of character. What we do, not when everyone's watching, that's easy. It's what we do even when we think no one is watching. That's it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. And certainly special thank you to you, John, for taking time out of your uh, busy schedule. Of course, Ron. Oh, thank um, you, guys. Uh, to APM, I want to say congratulations again. Uh, if you would like to support the good work that APM is doing in community and economic development, I encourage you to take just five minutes, visit their website, uh, make a donation. Go to apmphilly.org, click Get Involved, and then Donate. Uh, it's a fantastic organization, you know, been a partner to me and my organization for many, many, many years. You see the impact that they've made in the communities, uh, mixed income communities. Healthcare, education, it, it, it works. And they're the quintessential example of what's 
how to do it the right way. So congratulations. And I want to thank everyone this afternoon. Uh, buenas tardes and enjoy the rest of your week. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you for joining us today for this special event. The APM 50th Anniversary Speaker Series continues next month with our final program that will focus on childhood trauma. We'll welcome an expert panel on child protective services and our special guest speaker, child safety activist, Elizabeth Smart. That's Wednesday, December 9th at 12 p.m. Eastern. For more information and to register, please view the APM website. We wish you continued good health. Good afternoon. Thank you.